Hello doctors, this is Dr. Hira Salman. So let's continue um, this uh, infectious diseases session. So we are going to start today from central nervous system infections. So see all central nervous system infections may present with fever, headache, nausea, vomiting. These are the typical signs and symptoms of this infection. These infections, especially of CNS, all of them can lead to seizures, uh, all of them. Maybe meningitis, maybe encephalitis, maybe abscess. If it's a CNS infection, they will definitely lead to seizures and they will be accompanied by fever, headache, nausea and vomiting. So say for example, clues to answering the most likely diagnosis question. If the patient is having meningitis, what symptoms he or she is going to tell you? They may be or you are going to see signs you are going to notice and symptoms definitely patient will tell you. So there must be stiff neck, there must be photophobia and meningismus. So these are the symptoms of especially meningitis. If there is only confusion, if the patient is only having confusion with others, uh, you know, if, if features like fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, but plus confusion is also there, then we will make the diagnosis of encephalitis. If there are focal neurological findings, then we will be suspecting abscess. So these are only the clue that these are peculiar symptoms by which we can make the diagnosis. So starting with the meningitis first, meningitis is an infection or inflammation of the covering or meninges of the CNS. Virtually any infection could cause this, but strap pneumonia, streptococcus pneumonia 60% case may, or group B streptococcus 14% cases hemophilus influenza 7% nasalia meningitis 15% and listeria account for 2% account for over 95% of cases so these are the infections including streptococcus pneumonia group b streptococcus hemophilus nasalia listeria they are account for over 95% of cases and among all definitely streptococcus pneumonia is the major is the most important one uh, causing this meningitis Staphylococcus occurs in those with recent neurosurgery. So mostly associated with those who are, have, have undergone recent neurosurgery. Now, what are the most important features and what presentation, how this meningitis is going to present? Look for a fever, headache, neck stiffness. There may be knuckle rigidity you are going to see and photophobia. So if there is knuckle rigidity, if there is photophobia, if there is neck stiffness, fever, headache, definitely we're going to make the diagnosis of uh, meningitis. Acute bacterial meningitis develops over several hours. It will take several hours. Focal neurological abnormalities occur in up to 30% of patients. If confusion occurs, you will not be able to the you, you will not be able to answer what is the most likely diagnosis because you know this confusion word is very specific for encephalitis in CNS. Without a CT and lumbar puncture, uh, so definitely without doing CT and without doing lumbar puncture, you can't say this is uh, encephalitis and this is meningitis. You have to go for the CT and LP in order to make the final diagnosis. Cryptococcal meningitis may be present for several weeks. Now, organism specific presentation, what is the most likely diagnosis? Say, for example, the patient is, uh, is of AIDS, like he's having AIDS with CD4 cell count less than 100. So, if the patient is HIV and he is having less than 100 count CD4 cell count, then you will say the most likely diagnosis in AIDS with such low count and such presentation of CNS symptom, it must be a cryptococcal meningitis. If he is a cancer, or hike if he's having history of camping or hiking and rash shape like a target appeared and joint pain is there facial palsy is there and he remembered the take bite in about 20 percent of cases then you will say it's a case of lyme disease if he's a camper or hiker and rash moves from arms to legs to trunk for starting from the arms or legs and they're moving towards the trunk and he remembered the tick uh, bite in about 60 percent of cases then we will say maybe it's an infection of rocky mountain spotted fever if he's having you know sign and symptoms of pulmonary tb then mostly pulmonary TB in 85% of cases that is caused by that is the tuberculosis infection. If there is nothing, you know, significant in the presentation will make the diagnosis of viral. And if he is an adolescent, he's having pitical rashes, will make the diagnosis of Neisseria meningitis. So these are the most likely diagnosis with the specific presentations. Now, how we are going to diagnose our patient that he is a patient of meningitis, the best initial test and the most accurate test. If you are considering best initial, if you are considering most accurate, both will be lumbar puncture. So how we are going to evaluate CSF? Now coming towards the cerebrospinal fluid evaluation. For cerebrospinal fluid evaluation, we will see the cell count, we will see the protein level, we will see the glucose level, we will see the stain and cultures. So keeping bacterial meningitis in our head, cryptococcus, Lyme, rickettsia infection, TB infection, viral infection, and now we are going to differentiate one by one. Say for example, if it's a case of bacterial meningitis, you are going to see 
cell count of only in thousands and which one is the predominant here the neutrophils are predominant here so cell count is only thousand and neutrophils are predominant here you are going to see elevated protein level if it's a bacterial meningitis there you will see elevated protein level you will see decreased glucose level and if you do the stain and culture then on stain and culture you will see 50 to 70 percent uh, on staining they will come up and a culture is 90 percent sensitive so it's highly good highly sensitive so in bacterial meningitis thousand neutrophils protein is elevated glucose is decreased and culture is 90 percent uh, cul on culture 90 percent sensitivity is there now if you are considering cryptococcus lyme or rickettsia infection you will see the cell count only in between 10 to hundreds and most predominant there is lymphocyte right lymphocytes are predominant there and protein level you will possibly elevate it there may be chances that you will see protein elevation but it's not like that markedly elevated it's not like that elevated or it's not like that normal there must be a possible elevation right in glucose similarly possibly decreased but staining and culture will be negative so if there is staining and culture negative with lymphocytes predominant with having protein or glucose level possible elevation and decrease then you can say this may be an infection of cryptococcus laminaricate so when you do the pcr you will know exactly which organism is this for tuberculosis again the same thing you are going to see cell count in between 10 to 100 but lymphocytes again prominent only in the case of bacterial meningitis you saw this neutrophils are predominant right in the case of other cryptococcal lyme rickettsia tb and viral you will see all the lymphocytes are predominant there and 10 to 100 cell counts but the in tb it is very important it's a highly differentiating point you are going to see protein levels markedly elevated right but glucose may be low there must not be a, every time glucose will be low but in some cases you you will see it normal level but may be low stain and culture is definitely negative so if there are lymphocytes and protein levels markedly elevated you will make the diagnosis of tuberculosis in viral again the same count 10 to 100 lymphocytes are predominant protein level usually normal in viral usually glucose level is also normal and you're going you're not going to see anything in staining and culture so for viral only the important thing is lymphocyte is there now when is a head CT the best initial test when you're going to offer head CT head CT is necessary prior to an LP this is very important point for exam point of view head CT is necessary prior to an LP only if there is the possibility that a space occupying lesion may cause herniation no doubt we uh, usually perform LP first but we can go for the head CT first if there is possibility that space occupying lesion is the cause of herniation or answer head CT first when any of the following is present we will say we'll go for the head CT first why because if there is papilledema if there are seizures associated if there are focal neurological findings or abnormalities in our patient if there is confusion interfering with the neurological examination then you will say we should go for the head CT first and then we will do LP later so here you can see papilledema blood disc margin is there papilledema is blurred fuzzy disc sorry fuzzy disc uh, margin from increased intracranial pressure so these are the typical findings in our patient if he is having papilledema seizures focal neurological abnormalities if he is confused there we will definitely go for the head ct first and then we will perform lp so you cannot do an accurate neurological examination if the patient is severely confused or it's 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 natural right if the patient is severely confused how you're going to examine how you're going to do the neurological examination for the neurological examination your patient should be oriented with time place and person in order to be accurate a neurological examination needs a cooperative patient who can understand and follow instructions and answer question now tip for here is that if there is contraindication to immediate lp giving antibiotic is the best initial step in management so what you're going to do if there if you can't perform lp right now then what you will do you can offer you can give antibiotic to your patient as a best initial test if there is any contraindication to immediate lp it is always mandatory to go for the lp lp the slumber puncture first but because of any reason if you won't be able to do that then give him or her antibiotic right better to treat and decrease the accuracy of a test than to risk permanent brain damage why we are offering antibiotic if lp is contraindicated why because we want to decrease the risk of permanent brain damage that's why we are offering this antibiotic so 
Now we are going to summarize the CNS infection. We will say if the patient is complaining of stiff neck, if he, if he or she is having photophobia, then how we are going to proceed. If he is having HIV and he is having less than 134 cell count, we will think of this cryptococcus meningitis. If, if there is a history of camping and hiking and he is having a rash with target like shape, joint pain is there, facial palsy is there and he remembered the ticket about 20% of cases, then we will say it's a Lyme disease. If he is a camper and hiker and he is having a rash which is moving from the arms and legs to the trunk and he remembered taking 60% cases, then we will say this is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever Infection. If there is pulmonary TB in 85% of cases, then we will say, yeah, this is tuberculosis. If none of the sign and symptom is there, we will make the diagnosis of viral meningitis. If he is an adolescent, he is having particular rashes, then we will make the diagnosis of Nazaria infection. So this is all about the CNS infections, most likely diagnosis algorithm. Now we are coming towards bacterial antigen detection that is latex agglutination testing. These tests are similar to a gram stain. These bacterial antigen detection is just similar to a gram stain. If antigen detection methods are positive, they are extremely specific and if they are negative, the person could still have the infection. So it's not like that if the patient is negative, the patient is not having infection. No, he must be having or he might not be having. So there are possible chances. But if, if it's positive, it means that yes, the patient is having infection, right? So these tests by themselves are not sufficiently sensitive to exclude bacterial meningitis. Sensitivity ranges from 50 to 90% depending on the organism so bacterial antigen detection tests are rarely indicated we are not going to indicate we are not going to offer them uh, oftenly they are rarely indicated when is bacterial antigen antigen test indicated when you are going to indicate when the patient has received antibiotics prior to the LP because we know very well if we are giving antibiotic to our patient prior to LP the LP findings will be changed right and culture may be falsely negative so how we are, how we come to know that the patient is having this infection then only we can proceed for bacterial antigen detection so if if there was any contraindication for the immediate LP and you have already given antibiotic to your patient don't worry about the result or especially false negative result you will always go for bacterial antigen detection test later on in order to get exact result who is who is responsible for that now organism specific diagnostic testing so these are specific diagnostic testing they are specific to specific organism what is the most accurate diagnostic test say for example if the patient is having tuberculosis so we know very well if the patient is having tuberculosis will go for the acid fast stain culture on three high volume lumbar punctures Centrifuge the specimen to concentrate the organism. TB has the highest CSF protein level. Among all infection, TB has the highest protein level. An acid fasting of a single uncentrifuged sample of CSF has only 10% sensitivity. So it's always better go for the three high volume lumbar puncture instead of getting only one single centrifuge sample. No, go for the three high volume LP uh, for this acid fasting cultures. Now, in order, to, if there is Lyme and Rickettsia, what are the specific tests for this Lyme and Rickettsia? We have specific serological testing like ELISA testing, Western blotting, we have PCR, polyvinylase chain reaction. By doing these tests, we will come to know, yeah, it's a Lyme disease reaction, it's a Rickettsia infection. Now, cryptococcus. For cryptococcus, we have this India ink in about 60 to 70 percent. It's 60 to 70 percent sensitive. So, if you are suspecting cryptococcal infection, for the confirmation of diagnosis, we will do this India ink testing. Cryptococcal antigen is more than 95 percent sensitive and specific. So, we will we'll go for the antigen testing also because it's more sensitive 95 percent sensitive and 95 percent specific. Culture of fungus is 100 percent specific because cryptococcus is a fungal infection. We can go for the culture and it will give you 100 percent result. If there is if there is cryptococcal infection, you will be getting something on the culture. So that's 100% specific. Now, if we're suspecting viral, then we will only come to know it's a viral on the basis of diagnosis of exclusion. Expose, exclude all, at last, we'll make the diagnosis of viral infection. Now, treatment of meningitis. The best initial treatment for bacterial meningitis, if it's a case of bacterial meningitis, we'll go for the ceftriaxone, vancomycin, steroids. You will base your treatment answer on the cell count. Culture takes two to three days and is never available at the time that the treatment decision is made. Of course, we'll start the empiric therapy, but we will ch always change the therapy later on according to culture and sensitivity result. Gram stain is good if it's positive. However, the false negative rate is 30 to 50%. Protein and glucose levels are too non-specific to allow for a treatment decision. Thousands of neutrophils on CSF 
means that you're going to give ceftriaxon, vancomycin, steroids. We know very well neutrophils dominant, neutrophil dominant. It's a bacterial one, right? So you start with the ceftriaxon, vancomycin, steroids, and you will add ampicillin. If immunocompromised, if the patient is immunocompromised for listeria, then you can add ampicillin. Ampicillin will give a good cover for listeria if the patient is immunocompromised for listeria. Now, all those steroids like dexamethasone have been proven to low mortality only in a streptococcus pneumonia infection. You must give them when you see thousands of neutrophils because you will not know the culture result for several days. So, it's always better to go with the steroids among with all the antibiotics like ceftriaxone, and vancomycin and you will give a steroid. Why we are giving a steroid dexamethasone to your patient? Because, yes, because thousands of neutrophils are there and we don't know the exact organism so in order to lower the mortality right especially if it's a case of streptococcus pneumonia infection we don't know not right now that this is yes this is streptococcus pneumonia we're just keeping in mind if, if it's an infection we should go for the steroids now listeria monocytogens listeria is resistant to all cephalosporin but sensitive to penicillin so you must add ampicillin to ceftriaxone and vancomycin if the case describes risk factors for listeria so these risk factors are now listeria so this is important you must add ampicillin we are going to add ampicillin to ceftriaxone and vancomycin right especially in case of listeria infection so what are the risk factors for this infection if, if the patient is eld, uh, old right elderly is the one new nates and new nates up to one month old uh, child uh, or um, uh, of course infant steroid use infant is one year old right new is just one month old now steroid use those who are who are, uh, who are actually on steroids and the one who is having AIDS or HIV immunocompromised including and he's an alcoholic right alcoholism pregnancy these are all the risk factors for listeria infection and can you see in all of these cases, cases most of the time immunity is compromised right somewhere so if it's a case of tuberculosis now we're going to summarize this cns infection algorithm most accurate diagnostic test say for example if you're considering tuberculosis we'll go for the acid fast stain, stain testing especially in three high volume lumbar punctures centrifuge the to concentrate the organism and tb has high csf protein uncentrifuge sample of csf only give you you know 10 percent sensitivity so it's always better to go for three high volume lumbar punctures uh, cultures for acid fast stain then Lyme and Rickettsia, specific serology testing you are going to do for this Lyme and Rickettsia. We have ELISA testing, Western blotting, PCR, for especially for this Lyme and Rickettsia. For cryptococcal infection, we will check the cryptococcal antigen and that antigen we know it's more than 95% sensitive and specific. For the case of viral infection, you do the test for all and it will be a viral on the basis of diagnosis of exclusion, right? Now we're coming towards Nizaria meningitis. If there is Nizaria meningitis, what additional management you are going to offer? You will isolate your patient. Respiratory isolation should be given. Rifampin, ciprofloxacin, ceftriaxone to the close contact to decrease nasopharyngeal carriage. So we want to decrease the nasopharyngeal carriage. In order to do that, we will provide this rifampin, ciprofloxacin or ceftriaxone. For the close contact, this is very important for your exam point of view. For close contact means those who have major respiratory fluid contacts such as household contacts, kissing or sharing cigarettes or eating utensils, we will give them prophylaxis, right? And what is the prophylaxis? We have rifampin, ciprofloxacin and ceftriaxone. These are actually for the prophylaxis to the close contacts. And what do we mean by close contact? We should know the definition of close contact. Close contact means that those who have major respiratory fluid contact like household contact kissing, sharing, eating utensils. Routine school and work contact, contacts are not close contacts. So you're not going to offer them any prophylactic treatment. Sitting in class with someone with Zarian faction does not make them a close contact. Healthcare workers qualify only if they intubate the patient, if they come, if they, you know, come across with the secretions, then only you will say, uh, they will you know they should receive this prophylaxis perform suctioning or have contact with the respiratory secretion so these are the things where we can say they will come in contact with the secretions and we should provide them prophylaxis now a man comes to the emergency department with fever severe headache neck stiffness and photophobia on physical examination he is found to have weakness of his left arm and leg what is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient so he is having fever severe headache neck stiffness photophobia is there on examination, you will see this weakness of his left arm and leg. What is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? So, first, 
when there is contraindication see you are not going to do lp first why because you know because he is having fever severe headache neck stiffness and photophobia and on physical examination he is found to have weakness of his left arm and leg now when there is contraindication to an immediate lp the most important step is to initiate treatment so we have ceftriaxone and steroid alone would not be sufficient this patient presentation is clear for meningitis he is having neck stiffness he is having headache photophobia the only thing is that the the, the one which is having their weakness of his left arm and leg this is the point where we are not going to go for lp first we will give him antibiotic first so ceftriaxone and steroid alone would not be sufficient this patient presentation is clear for meningitis although antibiotic may decrease the sensitivity of the csf culture it is more important to prevent neurological damage see these neurological signs this weakness are the neurological signs so in order it is important to prevent neurological damage from untreated meningitis than is to have a specific microbiological diagnosis you can also still use the gram stain and bacterial antigen detection methods to establish a diagnosis after the start of antibiotic this we already did right if the patient if you already introduce an antibiotic to your patient because there is contraindication for lp so that's why we are giving antibiotic but we will think oh because of giving antibiotic the result might be changed no problem you will always do bacterial antigen testing later on and you will confirm the diagnosis right so a head ct is important for this patient because of focal neurological deficit only the thing here in this question he is having weakness of arms and legs that is giving you a clue that he is having focal neurological deficit and for that we will always prefer to go for head ct CT first rather doing LP or if there is like right now if there is contraindication for LP you will go for antibiotic so just go give him antibiotic take him to the CT scan and then you can later on perform CT, uh, LP so in addition if the head CT shows a mass lesion you may never be able to perform an LP right if there is a mass lesion how you're going to perform an LP you will, you will not do that right so in, in that case you will also give antibiotic first so and here the antibiotic is ceftriaxone vancomycin and steroids Consultation is almost always a wrong answer on USMLE step 2 CK. What is the most common neurological deficit of untreated bacterial meningitis? What is the most common neurological deficit of untreated bacterial meningitis? If you are not offering any treatment to the bacterial meningitis, then what will be the most common neurological deficit? deficit uh, uh, this deficit, there will be eight cranial nerve deficit or deafness. So you should prevent this, right? And how you're going to prevent this by giving right time antibiotics now we are coming towards encephalitis for encephalitis confusion word you should remember so uh, look for acute onset of fever and confusion although there are many cases of encephalitis herpes simplex is by far the most common cause the most common cause we should know the most common cause so most common cause here is herpes simplex you must do a head ct first because of presence of confusion whenever there is confusion you will go for the head ct first what is the most accurate test of herpes encephalitis for herpes encephalitis what you're going to do for the most accurate testing we have PCR, polymerase chain reaction, polymerase chain reaction of CSF. That will give you a clue for herpes encephalitis and that is considered to be a most accurate test. So PCR is more accurate than a brain biopsy. Serology for herpes is useless. 95% of population will be positive since blood serology cannot distinguish oral herpes from a routine cold sore. If you can't, if you won't be able to dis distinguish, this is oral herpes, this is genital herpes, this is encephalitis, this is cold sores, then what is the point of doing that, right? So we are not going for the blood serology because on the basis of blood serology, we won't be able to distinguish between oral herpes, cold sores, genital herpes, and encephalitis. Zang prep can be done as the initial test on a genital ulcerative lesion. For the genital ulcerative lesion, we will do the Zang preparation, but not for here in this case. Viral culture is the most accurate test of genital skin lesion, but not of CSF or the brain. So here especially uh, if you are considering encephalitis for the CNS infection we will definitely go for PCR of CSF. Now how you are going to treat your patient? Acyclovir is the best initial therapy for herpes encephalitis. If it's the case of herpes encephalitis go for this antiviral treatment acyclovir. Famcyclovir and velocyclovir are not available as intravenous formulations. Foscarnate is used for acyclovir resistant herpes. If the patient is having herpes but he is very resistive towards acyclovir then we have an alternative medication. We have this foscarnate. So you can use only foscarnate in those patients who are resistant 
resistive towards acyclovir. Now, a woman is admitted for herpes encephalitis confirmed by PCR after four days of acyclovir. Her creatinine level begins to rise. What is the most appropriate next step in management? So, she is uh, admitting because of herpes encephalitis, and you are already confirmed it by doing PCR. After four days of acyclovir, her creatinine level begins to rise. Now, what is the most appropriate next step in the management? Of course, because of this acyclovir, her creatinine level is rising. Now, what you're going to do, you will reduce the dose of acyclovir and you will hydrate your patient so oral medications such as famciclovir velocyclovir are insufficient for herpes encephalitis although acyclovir may occasionally be renal toxic but the medication precipitates in the renal tubules foscarnate has far more renal toxicity so we are not going to switch it to foscarnate we will just reduce the dose of acyclovir and we will hydrate our patient in this scenario all right now we are going to start this head and neck infection first of all influenza the flu influenza present where these are the signs and symptoms of influenza arthralgias and myalgias in your patient cough fever headache and sore throat he must be having nausea vomiting diarrhea especially in children so you will say according to these signs and symptoms you may suspect this is a case of influenza the most appropriate next step in management is depend on the time course from presentation if within 48 hours since the onset of symptoms perform a nasopharyngeal swab or wash in order to rapidly detect the antigen associated with influenza so this is important the most appropriate see it's very important to know what is the most appropriate next step in management what is the initial management and what is the best uh, management right best best option so here the most appropriate next step will be it depending upon the time course from presentation like if the patient comes to you within 48 hours since the onset of symptoms then you will perform a nasopharyngeal swab right or wash in order to rapidly detect the antigen associated with influenza now, how you're going to treat your patient? Less than 48 hours of symptoms, you can give oseltamivir, zenamivir, neuromidase inhibitors, shorten the duration of symptoms. These antivirals will shorten the duration. These drugs treat both influenza A and B. The spiramivir is the intravenous version. So, you need to give it intravenously if, if the signs and symptoms are more worse, right? Other than that, we can only go for the oral one. Now, more than 48 hours of symptom. Now, if the patient comes to you and it's more than 48 hours of symptoms, now what you will go, what you are going to do? Symptomatic treatment only. You will only treat symptomatically. You will provide analgesia, painkiller. You will advise rest you will give antipyretic for the fever you will hydrate your patient just the symptomatic treatment if it's more than 48 hours because you know viral is having a cycle once the cycle is completed no need to give anything right and cycle is only about 48 hours now Pyramivir is an intravenous version of oseltamivir. So, if a patient is ill enough to be hospitalized, give a neuromidase inhibitor even if it's more than 48 hours since the onset of symptoms. So, this is important to remember that this pyramivir is an IV for version of oseltamivir. And if the patient is still enough to be hospitalized, giving a neuro give a neuromidase inhibitor even if it's more than 48 hours because he's having he is quite ill right then we can go for the neuromidase inhibitor no matter it's if it's more than 48 hours if you need to admit your patient you should give him some iv thing right and that is uh, this neuromidase inhibitor now, oseltamivir and zenamivir do not successfully treat complications of influenza such as pneumonia. So, if complications are there, then you need to treat accordingly, right? But you don't think that you are actually treating the complications. So, oseltamivir and zenamivir do not successfully treat the complications of influenza. And first and foremost complication of influenza is pneumonia. So, oseltamivir and zenamivir has no role on pneumonia prevention or pneumonia uh, treatment. All right, now we're coming towards infectious diarrhea, blood and WBC is in stool. Now, if we see blood and WBC in stool, so what are the main organisms? Say, for example, uh, if you're considering salmonella, salmonella is usually, you know, going to uh, be seen in poultry things, right? Farmers eat poultry things, chicken or these birds, all these, you know, the, the they're especially the meat having the salmonella infection. Then we have campylobacter, most common cause associated with GBS, group B streptococcal infection, they are mostly associated with that. And E. coli, E. coli, especially the strain uh, 0157 H287, that's hemolytic, it's associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome. E. coli is responsible for this HUS. Shigella, second most common association with HUS, this hemolytic uremic syndrome, first association with this, and second is with Shigella. 
vibrio parahemolyticus you are going to see in shellfish and cruise ships this infection is going to is spread by shellfish and cruise ships vibrio vulnificus shellfish history of liver disease skin lesions these are actually there you will see your xenia high affinity is having high affinity for iron so these are the important points to ponder for every specific organism so your xenia having high affinity for iron hemo it's you know in case of hemochromatosis you are going to see a xenia infection in blood transfusion there will be your xenia you can find your xenia there clostridium difficile white and red blood cells in stool they are responsible for especially if there are white and red blood cells in stool you will think of this clostridium difficile now the best initial test is for blood or fecal leukocyte but this will not determine a specific organism initial testing will be that is blood and fecal leukocytes right but that will not determine a specific organism a stool lactoferrin has greater sensitivity and specificity compared with stool leukocytes lactoferrin is a better answer than fecal leukocytes so if you have fecal leukocytes and lactoferrin so it's stool lactoferrin because of having greater sensitivity and specificity you will go for the lactoferrin don't go for the stool leukocytes right so lactoferrin is a better answer than fecal leukocyte if it's one of the choices the most accurate test is stool culture so we will think we will actually do what if they are asking in the question the best initial test we will go for the fecal leukocyte right but as we know that stool lactoferrin has greater sensitivity and specificity compared with stool leukocytes then what we are going to do we will choose lactoferrin if lactoferrin is in the answer choices we will not choose as a best initial this fecal leukocyte we will choose lactoferrin but if lactoferrin is not in the choices we will go for the fecal leukocyte but if they are asking the most accurate test we will go for the stool culture now if there is no blood or no wbc in stool so these are all about the one who are having blood and wbc's in stool now we are coming toward if there is no blood or no wbc's in stool then we will always think of viral infection we'll think of this giardia giardia most commonly associated in campers and hikers and unfiltered fresh water those who are taking unfiltered fresh water they are more prone towards getting this giardiasis cryptosporidiosis whenever there is an infection of cryptosporidiosis always think of this aids infection Okay, Azan is here. Uh, let me listen, Azan. Just two minutes. All right. Now coming back towards no blood or WBC in stool. So if there is no blood and no WBC in stool, then we can think of this viral infection. We can think of this giardias as most commonly in campers and hikers and those who are ha having this unfiltered fresh water. Now cryptosporidiosis. If there is a patient of AIDS with less than 100 CD4 cell count, detect with modified acid fasting. You will always think of this cryptosporidiosis infection, and you you can always detect it with modified acid fasting. If there is vomiting, think of this bacillus cereus. If there is vomiting, think of Staphylococcus, right? And these bacillus cereus and Staphylococcus they are presenting with no blood or WBC in, in stool. All right, scombroid. Scombroid most rapid onset. Wheezing, flushing, rash you are going to see with this infection and they are mostly found in fishes, right? And you are going to treat with antihistamine, this scombroid infection. Now, how we are going to treat all these infections? If it's a mild disease, you will only give uh, oral fluid replacement, right? In case of diarrhea. But in case of severe disease, you are going to do the fluid replacement and definitely you are, you are going for oral antibiotics. Which oral antibiotic? You are giving ciprofloxacin. Quinolone. Quinolone, we are going to give in a case of severe disease. Now, which of the following is the most accurate in determining the etiology of infectious diarrhea? 
which of the following is the most accurate in determining the etiology of infectious diarrhea if we want to know the etiology of infectious diarrhea we will go for blood in stool why because presence of blood in the stool means there has to be an invasive pathogen that is actually invaded the gi epithelium that is salmonella salmonella is one of the invasive pathogen shigella is one of the invasive pathogen yersinia is one of the invasive pathogen and e coli these are all the invasive pathogen and that's why they can they are responsible for creating this bleeding in the stools right so blood in the stool because of these infection because they invade the epithelium the other aspect on with the mucosa the other aspects such as what food was eaten then bowel movement frequency and smell are useless stop smelling stool it's a bad <laughs> all bad smelling so severe infectious diarrhea means Severe infectious diarrhea means whenever there is hypertension, there is tachycardia, there is fever, there is abdominal pain. If there is hypertension, tachycardia, fever, abdominal pain, you will say this is severe infectious diarrhea. Or if the if the patient is having bloody diarrhea, if if overall presentation is metabolic acidosis, then you will say it's a severe infectious. So in severe infectious, six things we will know. We will we have to know hypertension, tachycardic, fever, abdominal pain, bloody diarrhea, and metabolic acidosis in that body. So that means it's a severe infectious diarrhea. Now we're coming towards disease specific treatment. So if it's a giardia infection, giardiasis will give metronidazole and tenedazole. If there is cryptosporidiosis infection will give we, we, we actually need to treat underlying AIDS right and nitazoxanide is the option for cryptosporidiosis if it's a viral infection we just give the fluid support as needed and if it's a bacillus serious infection if it's a staphylococcal infection we will not only give the fluid support as needed right we'll only give the fluid support as needed so for giardia metronidazole tenedazole for cryptosporidiosis you need to treat underlying AIDS and nitazoxanide for viral fluid for bacillus serious and staphylococcus fluid support support as needed these are the disease specific treatment okay i'm just going to stop here so tomorrow we'll continue from hepatitis thank you